sometimes I was the only one girl among 200 or 300 men. It's like, oh my gosh, what do I have to do? And like, there's <laughs> water everywhere. The whole platform is ice. <laughs> With the drop in oil price, does it affect your salary? If you are offshore, just imagine you are in limited place with a limited amount of people and you have to build these relations. I get a lot of questions in my Instagram, like how you joined offshore, is it possible? <laughs> okay, I'm ready to get transferred to the office. <laughs> Hello, Anna. Hello, how are you? Nice to Hello, see you. Hello, I'm girls. fine. What a pleasure. I'm Chris. This is my friend Veronica. Hello. Nice to meet you. It's, so I think it's going to be a good time because we're going to be sharing like your expertise and like the things that you do in your country and how things happen in your country. And we can talk about ours as well. So I think it's going to be like interesting for everybody. Amazing. Cool. Yeah. Exciting. Yeah. So uh, could you please start like talking about a little about yourself and talk about like what you do? I joined um, Oil and Gas here like six and a half years ago, I suppose, as a field engineer trainee in uh, oil and gas um, service company and um, did my, uh, you know, how to say, uh, step up in engineering and petroleum engineering and um, had experience three years in Siberia, in Arctic, in different places, in Russia, in the harshest ah, cool. place, I would say. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then, you know, when I just joined, I had two goals, two dreams to work abroad somewhere. Uh, don't know where, but somewhere abroad. Uh -huh. And of course, offshore, because it's just uh, a dream which I had. Because I just absolutely love the sea and I think that offshore it's always a level up. You know, you have a bigger responsibilities, a bigger equipment, etc., etc. Like this experience is very unique. So three years after um, I started in my career, I joined Caspian Sea offshore. It's like wow. the western part of Russia. It's quite hot and nice after Arctic. <laughs> Just moved there to warm up, you know. And uh -huh. After it, I got transferred to Netherlands. So it sounds like my two goals met. So yeah. I finally was happy. And after it, I was already, okay, I'm ready to get transferred to the office. <laughs> Cool. But was it different, like, working in the Netherlands and working in Russia? Did you see, like, a lot of difference or no? Yeah, between land and offshore, there are a lot of differences, I think, not only in Russia, but everywhere in the world. Uh, we can talk about, like, advantages and disadvantages, but the main thing is that uh, you really get more um, excitement because you get more uh, responsibilities when you're offshore, right? The yeah. hour on the rig costs really higher, like multiple uh, million dollars, right? So it's all about responsibility. Yeah. All right. And could you tell us a little bit about um, the mandatory requirements mm -hmm. uh, to work offshore in Russia? I think the first one is actually experience because I've never seen the person mm. over there which just stepped in directly after the university. Mm -hmm. um, what I marked over there is that average experience is like seven or ten years in the field and only after this the people can join actually offshore position. I was the youngest over there because I just had like three years, right? Uh-huh. Uh, so the experience is very important after it, uh, of, of course, language, nationality, because uh, if you work in Russia, you mainly have Russian clients. So you mm -hmm. have to know Russian. Um, I, I had some people which can't really uh, speak Russian. They were from United States when I worked on the Caspian offshore. But they mainly work at night, you know, uh, during night shifts when they just night need shift. to perform some calculations and advices to the client. And during daytime, you mainly have to have uh, uh, handed over to the person who can communicate fluently in Russian, right? Besides, uh, mm -hmm. sorry. Isso tem a ver, Verônica, fala com ela, por favor. Isso tem a ver com a pergunta que foi enviada aqui. Como o inglês ajudou ela na área offshore? 
Okay, so does it, does it have to do uh, with, um, so she wants to, someone is asking already a, a question. So has English helped you to work uh, in this field in Russia? No, because well, you use Russian, right? The language, the, the, the first language is Russian that you use well, on board, right? Yeah, the first language is Russian, but you can't even step in into my company if you don't know English. Because oh. all the documentation, all the mail chains, and uh, we still have some clients who only talk English, right? International clients. Or you can't really develop yourself uh, you can't go abroad if you don't know English so they they actually looking for the people who at least know Russian and English if you would like to join as engineer mm, okay so I'm gonna translate because there are some people who are watching us and don't speak like a lot of English okay uh, mm. então ela disse que a, a língua primária né a bordo é o russo mas ela disse que na empresa dela eles nem contratam se não falar inglês Né? Então, todo mundo lá fala russo e inglês. All right. And, But, uh, 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 have you ever been here in Brazil? I've never been uh, to Brazil, unfortunately. But it was one, uh, it is still one of my goals because uh, I heard a lot. And you have a, such a beautiful nature. So, I really would like to go one. Uh, I was only in Colombia. It's not so far away from you, but still yeah yeah close yeah <laughs> by the way i had a radiation safety officer training over there if you talk about the requirements right uh, uh -huh. about the trainings so if you just yeah. want to work offshore you you need to have some uh, you know to take some courses trainings like most of the time your company just supporting this and providing this uh -huh. for you and monitoring this uh, like you need to have a lot like radiation training it's kind of specific which I took in uh, Colombia but uh, like the basic minimum like safety training first aid uh, fire safety mm -hmm. and I think the most unique training I had is offshore survival I think if somebody who is watching us right now they probably heard about this it's called Boss Yet or Hewitt you know, it's it's just an amazing thing. Have you ever heard about it? We have the C CBSP, CBSP, which is something very similar about first aid and how to survive in the ocean, uh, yes. emergency, if, if it happens an accident or an emergency that we can do something. So we learn these first things to do, you know, in case we have a problem or an issue. So we mm -hmm. call this CBSP, CBSP. And we also have the huge. Uh, yeah, which okay. is uh, to escape, yeah, yeah. Um, in case we have an accident, uh, in case yeah, the helicopter one, falls and stuff. This one, it sounds like attraction, you know, when I just first time heard that I'm going somewhere, like you need to survive uh, in the helicopter, which will turn upside down. Uh -huh, the cabin. <laughs> your head will be down and you need to do something like you need to locate your window you need to unlock your belt and if you do it in the wrong direction you will be just floating under the water you know exactly it's just crazy and there are a lot of emotions when you go into this training and I even saw some man who you know like 40 50 years old and they were still nervous, like, how to do this? What is the crazy things that are going on? And not everybody passed this training, but it's exactly. actually mandatory. Yeah, exactly. I think it's very important to have this one. But I think the most important thing, like you said, is the emotions, all the feelings that are involved in this training, because... Well, you have the steps, you know the procedures, you, you know when to buckle, unbuckle this, the, 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 the belt. But the thing is that... The problem is like to control your anxiety. Yeah. You know, you're feeling nervous and somebody can be very nervous just beside you. So you're just like, oh my gosh, what do I have to do? And like, <laughs> there's water everywhere. Like I have to escape. I have to get out of here. And even though like the, the, um, the train is like in the pool or, you know, uh, we know that. And there is someone there looking at us. So if something happens, we will have help. But still, we get nervous, right? So I think that's the most difficult thing. Like when we get nervous and we 
I don't know. I think the anxiety, the anxiety is the problem yeah, in this course. Absolutely agree. And yeah. you just don't have time for this anxiety. Like you need to, to think, right? To think to fast. so quickly. Yeah. 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 I actually, so I just have to... even, you know, oh, sorry. Uh, I Go just ahead. saw one person wrote here. I have eager TV, something about this. And on my YouTube channel, I also have the video uh, where girls from different parts of the world sharing their emotions and this training, yes. uh, like a video of this one as well. Yes, yes in the offshore. I have a EGTV video from this training. And we have a question from Rafael. Could you please tell us some advice to start on offshore area about soft skills? Um, I think, you know, it's all about not only offshore it's just the soft skill which will help you in the future is communication i think the best communicators will really succeed in the future and if you are offshore just imagine you are in limited place with a limited amount of people and you have to build these relations you have to you know build these feelings of trust and in the future, you will feel that you belong to the community and it's very important because you have like, sometimes you are four months over there or like my longest hitch was two and a half months. So can you imagine wow. just people changing for some people? And you're there hitches. forever. Yeah, <laughs> it felt like forever. For some people, it's only two weeks and they just go on, on shore, they come back and they still see me like, oh no, what are you doing here? You're still here. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so that I happened to Marcella is. once. I know that Marcella is watching us. Marcella is my partner uh, at a cup of shore. And I used to embark with her on a, on a ship. Uh, but me as an English teacher, English and Portuguese teacher, and Marcella as a, a weld inspector. And I remember that I would disembark, embark, disembark, embark, and Marcella was still there. And I was like, uh -huh. what are you doing here? Because she would never disembark. Because she, had, she had been doing that time um, something longer, like the, 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 the job that her team needed to, to perform uh, on that vessel was like something more complicated. So she needed to stay uh, there for more time. But till nowadays, I, I, I make fun with this, like, because... Yeah, this happens sometimes. Like, I think that's a bad feeling. And you have to have this tolerance, talking about soft skills, not only about communication, but like this tolerance of like, okay, I'm here. I came here to stay to do this job. I have to stay here. Sometimes our back to back doesn't come, doesn't embark. So we have to stay a little bit more. And we were not expecting that. So we kind of feel frustrated, but then we had to like, Okay, so I think we have to be patient to work offshore, especially tolerant, you know, and know how to communicate very well, especially because we are in a dangerous place. So we have to um, be very aware of this. Yeah. Uh, communication mm -hmm. is very important because uh, uh, we can have accidents and then that's, that's a problem. That's a huge True. problem. Yeah. Are there more questions? Uh, sorry. Go ahead. Go just, ahead. A, just a small addition that positive thinking is really key. Like even if you have something which uh, goes wrong and every time at offshore, like at least in geophysics, in oil and gas, every time something goes wrong. But you still keep mm. this focus and you still keep this positive thinking and it really helps. Cool. All right. So I have another question, Anna. So does the labor market, the offshore labor market in Russia, um, hire a lot of people or it's difficult to enter? How does that work? Like, are there a lot of jobs in the offshore field in Russia? Well, I would say there are not so many, uh, mainly mm. because currently uh, it's a crisis. Obviously, everybody mm, knows yeah, yeah. about it, right? Well, previously, it was really attractive line of work, I would say, like 10 years ago. Like, mm -hmm. almost everybody in Russia wanted to work in oil and gas business because it's really attractive in terms of salary, in terms of money, mm. right, and stability. Uh, oh. But currently, what we have, uh, what we see, like, I would say, last five, seven years ago, IT market and marketing uh, are more popular sphere currently because you don't need to go, you know, to Siberia, Arctic or offshore and to survive in this uh, 
crazy conditions, uh, you still, you just need your laptop, right? And it's so easy to work from every place, uh, like wherever you like, right? So mm -hmm. it's not uh, a huge trend nowadays to join mm. uh, this sphere. But still, the people who, who work on land in oil and gas, they still, um, I feel that they would like to join offshore because I get a lot of questions in my Instagram, like how you joined offshore, is it possible, <laughs> how to do this, etc. So yeah, it's still important experience and the line in your CV on your resume yeah. for the future development. Yeah. How can you relate with the drop in oil price? Does it affect your salary, the salary? Well, it even affected my position because I worked in Netherlands uh, as equipment readiness lead. So I was leading the preparations of the geophysics uh, tools and uh, like all the work which we prepared in Netherlands, uh, also mobilizations to Germany, France, Spain and Italy uh, I, uh, and Switzerland, I guess. So once the, uh, the prices dropped, few um, bases were closed. So every day when I came to at work, I was like, oh, minus one person, minus one person. So everybody really wow. was stressed what will be next. So I got transferred within my company, but back to Russia, uh, to Moscow. And I thought like, oh, finally, I get my office position. It was uh, sourcing, no, it was um, something with uh, materials control lead. So I was like, so exciting. But then they told me it's not possible to go to the office due to COVID. So I was sitting in my village with a cow view and river view. <laughs> it was so nice and interesting experience. So Yeah, I got uh, transferred. And when you got transferred, your salary dropped because you no mm. longer work abroad. You work uh, in the same country from where you are you from, right? So mm -hmm. it's affected a lot, of, um, a lot of careers, not only mine. Yeah, here the same. A lot of people, a lot of people had been um, fired because, mm -hmm. yeah, when we have a crisis, these things happen, right? More awesome. questions, Chris? Right now, no. Nope. Okay, now let's talk about women in this field. A lot of women, few women. Of How does that work? No. <laughs> yeah. Of course. How did no. I know the answer? <laughs> so, well, like, uh, the people on board, like, how many people on board in average? Um, on the platforms where I worked, it's like uh, from 100 to 500, depends on the. Uh, how large the platform oh, is, right? 500? So some, wow. Yeah, on the biggest platform, you have like this. Um, the biggest platforms are located on Sakhalin. I've never been there, but I heard, like, for example, the longest well, probably you heard about this one, is 15 kilometers. Can you imagine? So in order to drill this, you need to have really huge Wow. Teams. And among these, um, you have some kind of maybe 1% or 2% of women, like, I mean, uh, on the platform. Uh, sometimes I was the only one girl among 200 or 300 men. Wow. And, yeah, in engineering, for sure. Uh, sometimes you have, uh, like, on the kitchen, you have women. Uh, so overall on the platform, you just yourself as an engineer and maybe three or four cookers, right? Got it. Ah. So it's not really, how to say, nice statistics. But by the way, uh, I'm leading Russia and Central Asia Connect Women group with that, within our uh, company, right? So a few weeks ago, I prepared presentation in order to find out where we're standing to uh -huh. get some numbers. Mm -hmm. So I found out that we are on the second place from the end as an industry in terms of gender diversity. So the least, okay. uh, the first place is construction sphere, right? It's like 11% of women over there. And for oil and gas sphere, it's 22%. Uh, 
which mm -hmm. is uh, well 22 is not bad right when you have this one percent at platform 22 overall it's still fine yeah but yeah. it's for sure it's not offshore it's not uh, on the engineering positions it's mainly in the office or somewhere so we uh -huh. really have some way to yeah. go in this a lot of things yeah a lot to improve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's even worse than in Brazil because in Brazil, for example, we have, let's think about of a, uh, an average of 100, 200 people on board. So we kind of have six, seven women on board, an average. Mm -hmm. Of course, it varies a lot. But I've been just to like one. 7%. Uh, mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So not just one or two. And not only people in the catering, uh, just cooking, mm -hmm. uh, but also as engineer, welding inspectors lab technicians laboratory technicians production That's operators good. yeah oh, yeah, yeah. so way. we have uh i'm uh, sorry i just um recalled one thing that on one platform on the arctic like it's the most northern platform which we have in russia uh -huh. there is a woman uh who worked as a crane operator can you imagine? Oh, like, that's so cool. She's managing like 500 um, kilograms of weight every time. So it's just amazing. We, wow. we have some cases, but there are not so many, unfortunately. Are there many, many Brazilian co-workers? If there are Brazilians working offshore in, in Russia, I think that's the question, right? Well, I heard from my friend who worked in uh, Sakhalin that uh, she faced with few guys um, from South America, I guess from Brazil, yeah, one. But uh, okay. mainly if we have somebody, it's mainly on Sakhalin platform. So on Caspian Sea, I just meant few guys from United States. That's it. Okay. So it's not so mm -hmm. multicultural environment, is it? Like just on Russians, Sakhalin. Americans? When when you have crisis, everybody gets home, mm. you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. there are not here so Brazil, many spots. Yeah, here in Brazil, it's very multicultural. We have people from India, South Africa, United States, Portugal, Philippines. Amazing. It's very multicultural, very interesting. The, so the exchange cool. we have on board, not only about language, but also about culture. It's very interesting. More it's questions, please? Community. Yes. It is, right? It is. What is an average month salary? Mm. Well, it's confidential. Sorry, guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. This is a, this is a very interesting question. Um, I'm inter an interculturalist, and I've, I've lived in New York. And um, <laughs> the director of the department that I used to work for in languages he asked me this question and for me it was so like, is he asking my salary? For me, that was so weird because for us Brazilians, we don't, we don't talk about uh, um, salaries. Mm -hmm. I mean, for us, it's like confidential. Like we don't even talk uh, to our uh, family about salary. I mean, there are some people who do, but it's not common like to talk about how much you get per month. Uh -huh. But in the U.S., when I lived there, they asked me this. The director of the, the department asked me this, how mm -hmm. much I, I got, um, I used to get per, per year because they think about mm -hmm. year there. Here we think about more per month. Uh, and for me, that was a very strange question. So the guy wrote to hear the question and this just reminded me of the situation because I think it's very cultural thing, right? There are some countries that you're going to be like, no, I don't, I don't share this kind of information. And there are some countries that, yeah, that's, that's okay. Like, for example, the United States, time is money. Everybody's, like, looking for money. So they, they don't have any issue to talk about it. But anyway, I also think that it depends a lot, right? It depends well, a lot on the position. I can say that, you, you have. know, um, I still have my um, channel and usually take interviews from the uh, girls and women in, in, in unique professions, like work talk women, which I called, and I always ask this question. And when somebody asks me, like, it's confidential, and I feel like I'm not fair. <laughs> so I'll tell mm -hmm. you that um, it really varies. It varies from position to position. When you just stop, step into the oil and gas sphere in the, suppose, in international company, then you can expect something from uh, $1,000, right? 
thousand dollars per month. But then when you grow, when you get the experience, exposure, and especially when you work, when you're from Russia, but work somewhere abroad in an international mm. company, then your salary can be like triple. Oh, wow. Veronica, cool. fala com ela, por favor, que em, no ranking das perguntas, aqui no Mundo Offshore, a primeira é quanto é o salário, e a segunda é se a comida é boa a bordo. Ah, ok, so we, we have some questions here. Most of the guys are asking about the salary, that's the top number one. <laughs> And the second one is, is the food good? <laughs> that's important. Well, that's important. very important. If someday you work at land in Siberia, Arctic, every food is good after it. I would say like All this. Right. <laughs> when But I on just... board, the food is not so good? No, I mean, when I just joined uh, offshore, it was for uh -huh. me like in a restaurant. It was oh, just amazing. Okay. Yeah, because oh, okay. when you work in Siberia or Arctic, I mean, at land somewhere, it's, it's just boring it's just so simple you know uh -huh. and when you go offshore they try really to do your food experience as good as possible because you don't have that many experiences and variety of something exactly. uh, from which you can get pleasure or some kind of happiness <laughs> so something has to we have the barbecue day the pizza day the italian food day <laughs> oh you yeah, have here this. we have We have, I mean, not in all platforms, but uh, like you said, they try to give us this experience as we like have been there, like working all those days and all those hours. So uh, most of the platforms have the barbecue day. So they mm -hmm. choose one day and we have barbecue and some platforms also have the pizza day. What do we have, for example, Christmas and uh, the New Year's Eve, they prepare very good food, you know. The first time that I ate lobster, because lobster in Brazil is kind of expensive. So the first time in that I Russia ate lobster well. was, yeah, so the first time that I ate ro lobster was offshore, and I was like, wow, that's so cool. <laughs> for free, <laughs> woohoo, I'm getting paid for that, awesome. <laughs> What about the But place? Really uh, have you eaten it uh, on the helideck, or was it barbecue party just in the kitchen, in the canteen? No, it's uh, it's outside, not on the helideck, but generally uh, uh, on a place that is like very close to the bathroom, but uh -huh. out, you mm -hmm. know, out. But it's not in a place that we have any kind of danger. It's just a small place that we can use in order to have the, the barbecue. And mm -hmm. it's like very close to the bathroom so that the guys from the, the, the kitchen can do not have like a lot of work to transport all the food. So I think it's very interesting because we have a good time in spite of all, uh, in spite of all the work, you know, and all the days on board. So I think it's good like to feel a little bit like relaxed. Okay, I'm, getting, I'm having barbecue and beer That's with awesome. no alcohol, which is horrible, but just to <laughs> pretend it's, uh, it's beer. <laughs> If you have a good fantasy, then you're okay. <laughs> exactly, right? Exactly. Chris, I can't hear. Mm, We have good questions. questions. <laughs> Can Marcella? you see the question, Anna? Oh, what is uh, the biggest challenge? Biggest... Yeah. What? Eu leio, você lê? Ela lê? <laughs> lê você, Veronica. Yeah, she, she read. What is the biggest challenge you, you have faced? Well, if you talk about Osher, um, Like every job we perform as a geophysics engineering uh, team, uh, it's a small challenge because every time you finish it, you feel some kind of reward. Like, yes, I did this. Like, I went through so many um, things, so many troubleshooting, but I did this. And one of the job I had, it was like a few days without any sleep. Because when you're offshore, I don't have, a, how to say, a back engineer, like an engineer which is on this another shift. Like, I'm alone as an engineer. Uh -huh, And okay. there are you're three operators. And uh, I just have to perform my job. It doesn't matter. It will be like six hours or it will be 70 hours. 
And if something goes wrong, it can be 70 hours, right? And once uh, I remember this kind of work, so everything went wrong, like tools doesn't work, calibration doesn't pass, uh, software, hardware issues. Um, I had only two operators, I guess, instead of three. So I went to, um, how to say, where you're screwing your tools, you know, mm -hmm. uh, on, the, on the well site. How do you call this? Let me try, try to. Um, so... Mm, the place where you put all your tools inside the well, right? Usually operators work there, but as there are not so many people, I went there and I worked as an operator as well. So okay. I was so dirty, I was so tired, I was so nervous, but still we did this job and even uh, ahead of time on a top level qual quality, and the client shake my hand, signed the letter of uh, job performed. And I went to the heli deck and it was sunrise. It was first time when I met sunrise because usually I like to sleep so much. And so imagine seeing the platform, the sun is rising and I'm super tired and dirty, like covered with oil. But I feel that, you know, I'm on top of the world because <laughs> I did something. I which, did it. Yeah, yeah, which is ahead of my abilities. Some kind of, I feel like I'm the only one woman engineer on this platform. And all this responsibility on, was all my shoulders. And we still did this as a team, you know. So it was crazy, but it, it is really rewarding in terms of emotions. Exactly. And um, I have a question. How do men uh, interact with you in terms of like, she's the leader, she's the engineer. Do they accept this well? Is it okay like for Not... men? Like, how is it? Mm -hmm. Or you have to prove that you're good? Da -da -da -da. You know, those well, things that women have to face. Yes, unfortunately, we have to prove. And every time I come to platform or to the new field, they like, are you a leader? Are you an engineer? And I'm like, yes, I'm a leader. And he's like, all right, some kind of what are you doing here? And then when we perform the job, when everything went smooth, when we finish ahead of time and they see that we can do this job like a man or sometimes even quicker because we are better in uh, planning, we are more flexible. Exactly. We are better in multitasking. So sometimes we even do this job better, right? So after this, they already, oh, I'm an engineer. Oh, finally. And then when I come uh, next time, they already, okay, they know me. They trust me. So first time is always awful, but uh, I just... Mm. Accept it. <laughs> just, just, just with the time that, like, after with you have time. proved that you're a good professional. But it's always like this, right? You have to prove that you can do this, that you're yeah. able to do this, that you have certifications. Yeah, that's a problem. I think it's worldwide, right? We always have this kind of problem. Tem uma pergunta aqui da Marcela que está dividida em duas partes. Tem a primeira você lê para ela e depois eu coloco a continuação, tá bom, Verônica? Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Aqui. Being a woman in this field brings up a mother role to be followed by the younger generation. Mm -hmm. mm, just a minute. How do you feel representing women and what is the lesson learned from it? Good question. Well, I would say that usually when I come, uh, doesn't matter offshore, onshore, I think that I'm a professional, I'm an engineer, and I don't think that I'm a woman, you know, like... I just focus on my abilities and my professional skills. It's not that I'm hiding my gender. It's about I'm not focusing on it. Um, so if you perform in this case, like, guys, I'm here to perform the job, right? Everything else, it doesn't matter. Then uh, they feel your power. They Because if you're focusing on something, oh, I don't like... Uh, the conditions or or it's only men over there how will i do this you know it's all about uh, the power which you have inside which we all as women have inside we just 
sometimes a bit scared and sometimes a bit not so confident as we can be, unfortunately. And another thing, we need to better control our emotions, what I think, because men are so uh, more closed, you know, and we can, um, we can really express too much. So this is something which we, can, which we need to learn. Um, the other things, just, just try to be confident in what you do, what you say, and don't talk too much. <laughs> As right, I do yeah. sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> More right. focused on performing the job itself. But do you feel that you inspire women? Like, do you get like a lot of messages on your Instagram from women that would like to work offshore, but maybe they think that it's not possible for them? Because I think that there is a tendency, maybe worldwide, that, um, okay, offshore industry is for men. So maybe when they see your Instagram, wow, there is a woman. And she's yeah. an engineer on board. So I can too. Like, do you feel, do you get messages from women? like asking you questions like how to enter the field? Do you feel that you will inspire women somehow? To be honest, that's why I'm trying to develop my Instagram just because I have a lot of messages from girls who are just uh, ah. writing to me. Thank you so much. Uh, I was so scared. Um, I was so unconfident, etc. And I thought it's only men's world. And then I see that you did this, then probably I can as well. So that's why I'm trying to support this social media. And I think it's very important to help uh, more women step into this because it's the only way how we can change this uh, gender balance. And every time after exactly. myself, when women came to the same platform, the client was already, oh, okay, woman, I have the place for you. I have a good experience before you. So I'm ready to welcome you here, you know. It's only the way how we can change it in the future. Exactly, exactly. Temos uma outra pergunta aqui, Verônica, que foi o Thales que mandou. E qual é a maior dificuldade de trabalhar é, na área de óleo e gás em um país que, numa plataforma, num país que não é tropical? So what is the, the biggest challenge uh, working uh, in the offshore industry in a place that is not so... Um, warm as Brazil is, like, so it's super cold. So what is, is there any challenge in terms of the, the temperature, the well, weather? Como é trabalhar ali no inverno, imagina. Yeah, for example, working in, in, the, in your cold, because it's super cold. Like, our cold in Brazil, it's like 11 degrees Celsius. Eh, that's not cold. I mean, okay, <laughs> the south, it's a little bit colder, but still nothing compared to your winter. So how is it, like, to work offshore in the extreme cold? How much do you get in the winter? It's crazy. I mean, it's minus 45 Celsius degrees. Uh, and sometimes Menos 45 was... graus. Wow. I needed to say Portuguese because it was like, wow. Wow. No, minus but it's, 45. It's not, it's not the biggest wow because you feel that it's like due to high humidity, you even feel it like minus 60 or minus 70 with the wind. Wow. And it's it's just crazy and people can work only a few minutes on the wind and then they go warm up, they went a few minutes, then go warm up. So the platforms they try to hide, they try to make it as close as possible. But oh, on some okay. platforms like where I worked on Caspian offshore, it was like minus twenty five, but it felt like minus fifty because it's open. They thought it's only its south platform. Like, how can they be the wind like this, the cold like this? So they made it open. And then this wind came and everybody just so freezed. They had the pictures, the crazy pictures with the snow everywhere Jesus. and ice. And, and the platform, it's even it's, uh, uh, covered by ice. It's becoming so slippery, just crazy because... You have the wind with the high humidity, with the sea around you, right? So the whole platform is ice. <laughs> right. So, so how, how do you do? Like, do you have a special, uh, um, uh, do you have a special coverall for that? Yeah, we have, um, I would say like these. Thickness. Very thick. Yeah, uh, the thick. And then you covered by parka we call it parka 
Ah, okay. <laughs> and then you have a lot of things which are kind of windy proofed, but not all the time. Like <laughs> okay, all right. So I'm gonna translate, like trying to summarize. Donna disse que algumas plataformas têm um tipo de engenharia que deixa um pouco mais fechado, né? Então não entra tanto vento assim. Mas algumas não, algumas são bem abertas, mas ela disse que tem um coverall, né? Tem um macacão que é mais grosso, mais específico para isso. E eles também investem uma parca, que pelo que eu entendi é tipo um sobretudo bem mais grosso, né? Que eles chamam de parca. All right, wow. Você está sofrendo com 10 graus, 15 graus, né? Eu, meu Deus. It's, it's, been, it's, been, it's, been like, it's been 10 degrees Celsius degrees here in, in, in Rio de Janeiro. And I've been feeling very cold. For me, it's extreme cold. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what it's called, right? Do you mean minus or plus? Plus. plus. Wow. <laughs> that that's our winter in Rio de Janeiro. In the south, it's almost zero degree one, something like that. That's our that's our extreme winter. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've lived abroad and I got minus twenty seven. No, minus 20 with the thermal sensation of minus 27 in New York. And for me, that was, I was like, okay, I cannot live here anymore. I have to go back to Brazil. I can't live here anymore. Yeah. Too cold. Eu, peguei, eu já peguei menos 17 e tinha sete camadas de roupa. Eu não imagino menos 40. No, she said minus 50, right? Yeah. Mas, the thermal sensation, menos 50 de sensação térmica. Você tem noção do que é isso? Não. É muito frio. Uh -huh. Ok, so we have a question here. Ah, tem. fala, Cris. Antônio fez a what, pergunta. What, vou... what are the advantages and the disadvantages of the legislation uh, in Russia in terms of uh, the labor legislation? So are the, the legislation good for the worker? So what are the good points and bad points in terms of legislation? Well, I'm not uh, HR person, unfortunately, so I can't really detail this uh, answer to this question. Uh, you mean legislation like for the workers, how good for the, the conditions for the are? Yeah, right? yes. Mm -hmm. Well, offshore is better than onshore, for sure, in terms of salary. Uh, the conditions are also good, but I heard that uh, in Canada, that in Norway, they are really better. Uh, so it's all about how you compare what you would like, like um, what are your requirements. So it mm -hmm. really varies. Like for me, after working uh, onshore, offshore was like a dream. So okay. for me, it was really cool. And I was thankful for all these uh, legislations. <laughs> But the difficult right, thing yeah. is uh, shifts, I guess. Because my shift oh, was yeah. six weeks on and three weeks off. And it was the hardest part of my engineering job. But is this a, a normal kind of hitch or no? Because here in Brazil we have 14-14, like 14 on, 14 days off. 14. Uh, 14 days. Amazing. Two, two weeks on, two weeks off. Not for foreigners. For foreigners, it's more time. Then it varies. Like, it's generally six weeks on, six weeks off for foreigners. Because they have to travel and then it takes time, you know. So, it wouldn't mm -hmm. be worth it for them uh, shorter than that. But, uh, yeah, for Brazilians, um, two weeks on, two weeks off. But there are some platforms that are 28 days on 28 off and sometimes 35 days on 35 off it really depends but these are the three hitches that are more common in brazil mm -hmm. so what is what is the common hitch that you have there i would say for oil service companies my hitch is common like six weeks on sometimes okay. even uh, eight like the longest i had two and a half months And then three or four weeks off. And the next uh, okay. common is month to month. Ok. So I'm going to translate Verônica. this. Ela está dizendo, então, deixa eu só, então, para resumir. Ela disse que a vantagem é o salário, que ela falou que é bem bacana, principalmente se eles russos forem para o Canadá ou para... Para onde que ela... Which is the other country that you said that the salaries are better? Canada and... 
Norway, all the European countries. Ah, ok. Tá, então os países europeus, Noruega, é, ou então para o Canadá. Então os salários são melhores. Então ela falou que a vantagem, the advantage, a vantagem é o salário. A desvantagem seria um, I, os hitches. Isso é o meu nome agora. I like, your language. Nome. I like how, how your language sounds. It's just amazing. É, thank you. É, <risos> gente, a escala. Isso não é uma palavra que some, escala. Então, a escala, ela falou que é uma desvantagem, porque são seis semanas a bordo e três em terra. Tá? E aí eu falei para ela que a gente tem aqui 14 dias a bordo, 14 dias em terra, às vezes 28, 28, e às vezes 35, 35. Falei que é dos estrangeiros... Então, é, aí já é mais semanal, né? De seis semanas on, é, em, a bordo, seis semanas em terra. Mas, claro, tudo isso varia. Mas eu falei para ela que as três são as mais comuns, assim, para brasileiros. Lá, seis semanas a bordo, três em terra. Six weeks on, three weeks on shore. Uh. <risos> Por favor, Verônica, pergunta para ela se... Com a pandemia, é, muitas coisas mudaram no, na... na... Se ela, se ela faz quarentena, na rotina. Se ela ah. faz quarentena, se ela faz PCR para subir... Okay, so good question. So, uh, someone is asking, like, with this pandemic, has things changed? Uh, for example, here in Brazil, we have to do the quarantine at the hotel for about one week, sometimes 10 days, and then we embark, and then when we disembark, we have to do the quarantine again. So, do you guys, like, has your routine changed because of the pandemic? And do you have to do the test? Yeah, exactly. Before? I mean, like, you have to test? all these regulations, I mean, in terms of COVID, I guess they are plus or minus the same in the whole world. Like, tests yeah, for I think sure. So. All this quarantine, two weeks for sure. But what is different in Russia, they uh, extend the hitches. So for my co-workers, for my friends, it was like month, month and a half. And then they made the hitches like two or three months. So they oh, just okay. extended till crazy. And the guys, they, it was so hard for them, you know. Um, But when was, you are on shore, you stay more time as well. Like two, everywhere. three months on shore as well. Okay. Everywhere. Offshore and offshore. Okay. Yeah. But no, now what I mean it, is like when you are slowly getting back to the normal hitches currently. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, but but what I mean is like when you stay like for two, three months on board, do you stay mm -hmm. the same time on shore? Like when you disembark, do you stay yeah. also like two, three months? Exactly. Ah, okay. Because you ah, have a person with whom you hand over. Right? Exactly, you're back to back. Yeah, back to back, yeah. Okay. Uh, and do you have to do the quarantine before you embark? You have to stay in the hotel before embarking? No. Uh, well, I didn't have this offshore experience once uh, the COVID came. I already uh -huh. moved to the office, right? So ah, for okay. me, it was different. When I just moved to Russia, I just went to my village and I quarantined over there for half a year. <risos> uhum. Ok, ok Então ela disse que agora ela está atuando é, Onshore e aí ela não teve Que fazer essa quarentena no hotel Mas ela disse que a galera lá Está ficando dois a três meses A bordo, né, justamente para não ficar Aqui em terra interagindo muito Mas também quando desembarca fica dois, três meses Em terra, então a, a escala Mudou e eles têm que sim Fazer o, o teste antes né? Uma regulação na, na verdade nacional Acho que na verdade mundial, né? todo mundo que vai trabalhar Offshore tem que fazer o o teste. Ok. I do you have more questions, Chris? I, I have one last question here for her. Somebody I, is writing, I want to see and offshore um, work clothes. It's not, uh, by the way, offshore clothes is just the clothes designed uh, by me. It's the same color. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because I just love coveralls. That's it. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. There is a question here. Which project are you doing? Well, currently I'm in sourcing. So I work with uh, suppliers, contracts, all these kind of things. More bureaucratic stuff. Yeah. Okay. My last question. So uh, has being an influencer uh, changed your life somehow? Like, Well, um I began to waste more time on Instagram. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, it's all about value, you know, when I try to think how my life has been changed, it's not changed that much because I always was an open-minded, very adventurous person, you know, I traveled a lot, so I just show it in the Instagram and I see that people like when you are sincere, right? So it's not changed that much, I'm just being myself. So the only thing which has changed, um, I started to think a bit more about value, which I really can make um, thanks to my Instagram or thanks to the community which I have. So I try to be more uh, helpful in these things and trying to think how can, uh, can I build a better community and how can I help better in a better way you know so that's why i started my youtube channel that's why i have this work talk women um broadcast live where i'm interviewing some amazing women probably i'll invite next time and interview you <laughs> oh super i would love <laughs> because i think we really need to have more um role models for for the girls exactly exactly Awesome. So I think that's it. Uh, we're almost done with our time. So I'm concerned about that because I think we have one hour, right? One Almost hour. Autosonic. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe we're going to fall. So I would like to thank you a lot for this. It was very interesting to talk and share your experience with us. And we could like come to know a little bit more about your experience on board as a woman in Russia. So totally different from our reality here. And it's very like far. So for us, it's like a very interesting way of learning a little bit more. Thank you. Uh, we're going to put a box here. of. Uh, in, in Brazil, we say obrigada. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Good pronunciation. I like it. <laughs> Anna, it's a pleasure. My English is not good as Ver in Veronica English, but I'm so glad to to be with you here. And I think the the main main the main message is woman woman's place is where she wants to stay. Okay, you, yes. you said this to to her to to us, and I'm very happy. In off Mundo Offshore is your home. Yeah. I'm, I'm so feliz. I'm very happy. <laughs> Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You are doing an amazing uh, job. Thank you so much. Yeah.